Good morning, good morning from Jamestown, North Dakota, the white, the white snowbound place. Welcome, Pastor Sean, coming to you live from Jamestown, North Dakota. We are on live. Let's get up and going. I want to see you hopping on real quick here. I got two people on. Welcome. Let's get going. I, I've got the men's Bible study Tuesday morning. You know how that goes, but uh, we are going to have a good time. Get going. I got 935 market, 935, so I won't be late. Tracy Tussison, Cheryl Hansen. Is that really you, ladies? Hello, Pam. Cousin Pam, I like third or fourth cousin. Third cousin. Nice to have you, Pam. Sherry, welcome. Ah, Lulu, my favorite Lulu. Good to have you. Sherry Sievertson, is that you today? Welcome. Tell Oli we're on and going. Good morning, dear sisters. It is good to have you. Very good to have you. I am going to just adjust my color a little bit. And Gwen Schmidt. Good to have you guys. Good to have you. Getting rolling here. It's 9.38, 9.38, just getting rolling. I just want you guys to know we are a little bit late today, but uh, I know we're, we're, uh, we're going to have some good stuff. There's my sister Dawn and my dear mother. Please pray for my granddaughter Erin. She's having her wisdom teeth out. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray for Erin. Help those teeth come out smoothly and everything to go well. Good morning, Brother Oli. That's oh, Oli. You're my favorite Oli. No doubt. He always laughs, but I'm, I'm serious. I'm not kidding. I wouldn't be lying about this serious thing. Sharon Odegaard. Hello, dear sister. Nice to have you guys. And so many of you have sent me nice cards. Thank you for the nice cards. Very, very kind, encouraging. This is about the most encouraging church a man could ever be, and I'm not kidding. You guys, uh, Pastor, appreciate Look at this. Look at this. It's on my desk. Cookies. I just walked into my uh, office, and I got cookies. And uh, it is encouraging. And uh, we are in the fight. We are in the fight together. We are fighting this battle together because we are God's called and holy church and we are lifting high the promises of God, which are so beautiful and wonderful in every way, every way. But today, uh, we are gonna. I want to take a look uh, as we are as we are uh, rolling through the scriptures. I want to take a look at First uh, Timothy, if you will, First Timothy chapter one, verse one through twenty. Good stuff. If you have your Bibles, open your Bibles, get your highlighters out. You're going to see men passing by in front of my window in just a little bit because my early morning Bible study with men just wrapped up. We had a good one. We are in Jeremiah. You know, if you guys ever want to get into some Old Testament stuff, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, and we, I love you guys too. Yeah, blessing. Is that my favorite farmer in the whole world, Brian Lacey from Minnesota? Just good to have you on, brother. You know, all you guys, I know you all, and that's that's what's fun, is I love you guys, and you know I love you guys. Um, as Paul loved the church of Ephesus, so I love this electronic victory church that we have on. Hello, Jody Bradall, welcome. Get your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 1, sister, and uh, we're going to get rolling, and God is going to bless. I know he's going to bless in a big way today. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'll get my little mic a little higher so that you can hear me. Had a funeral yesterday. Pray for Bill Walsh. Uh, one year ago, one year ago, uh, I uh, one year ago in a month, uh, and it was in September actually, I, I buried uh, Bill Walsh's wife, and then one year and a month later, I buried his son. And, uh, you know, I, I can't even go there to imagine losing a child. I just can't even go there. That's how bad it, it, it hurts my heart. And yesterday was, it was one of the most touching services. Sharon, you were there, you know, um, Irv and Eunice were there. Uh, we had a few there that were there just supporting Bill. Bill and his, his son, uh, he was a special needs uh, young man. And uh, it was, it was powerful. Hey, Rena Lang, so nice to have you. And that, is that Don and Jenny Steele, my favorite Don and Jenny Steele from up north? Good to have you. There's Kimmy Lawrence. Welcome, Kimmy. Welcome, Kimmy. I appreciate having you. You know, you think of some people, 
you see something, you think of certain things. Um, when I when I think of Kimmy, she's on with us right now. She told me one time how um, how wonderful it is to hear the gospel, and uh, that blessed me. That she she knew and waited for the gospel. She gets what the gospel is, and um, and. Anytime you listen to me, you're going to hear a clear distinction between law and gospel. That, that's going to eventually come very well. But we're in 1 Timothy 1, 1 to 20. Turn your Bibles. Here we go. Reading in the most powerful and precious anointed name above all names in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. Woo, that's a deep one. Grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul. He hasn't even started out yet. Here we go. He says, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Well, let's just pause for one second. Um... We know there are false doctrines being being preached and taught. And you say, but Pastor John, how do I know? I, I, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a theology degree. How do I know if, if I'm hearing a false doctrine or not? We have a simple litmus test. It came from Martin Luther himself. And really, this is why we go through catechism. Because we teach you in catechism, anytime you hear a doctrinal position being taught, there should always be scripture, Supporting scripture, supporting scripture. It's, it's chair passages, and, and that's allowing God to speak for God. Uh, and, uh, and you know if you're getting the full content of the scripture passages, if you're, you're, you're hearing the kind of the, the, the big idea theme of those passages and what, what, is, what is being supported there, uh, rather it be, you know, Christ has come for you, Christ has washed you. Here's the passages. Christ draws you out of the darkness. Here's the passages. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a long gospel perspective. You see that in, in the text, God is speaking. And he'll use you and I to do that. But we always use scripture to proclaim scripture. So that's how we stay away from false doctrine. Because we believe, you and I, we believe that God's word is 100% from God and 100% perfect. Those two million dollar words are called inerrant and infallible. Something the church used to stand on and was willing to die for, uh, you know, 500 years ago, 300 years ago, 200 years, 100 years ago. That used to be a predominant thing across most denominational lines. Nowadays, you got to do the litmus test, do the sniff test, because churches will say, well, we believe in one but not the other. We believe in a portion of one but not the complete another. And they'll make it sound like it, but then all of a sudden you'll hear the church uh, uh, promoting or pushing something. You say, I, that doesn't sound like the confirmation class I grew up in. That doesn't sound like the church I grew up in. Um, don't people need to confess their sin and call on the name of Jesus to be saved? Aren't we called to live a righteous life in Christ? Why does the gospel sound like me um, going out and uh, buying a house and and putting uh, you know some some um, people that are here illegal from a different country in that house or something like that. I mean, th th there's a twisting of the scripture. Now, should we help out people in need? Yeah. Should we help out aliens? Yeah. Should we help out foreigners? Yes. Yes. Help them out. But that's that's us responding to the gospel. That's not the gospel. We are called to help everybody, to help our neighbor. To love our neighbors. So, false doctrine. We got to be aware of the false doctrine. Be on it, and uh, we we must we must move on. Verse verse uh, in verse four, mid four B actually, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. That's the Mormons. They're into these crazy endless genealogies. Uh, such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Remember, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So here we roll. The goal then is of this command, which is love, which, co which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they're, 
or what they so confidently affirm. Okay, We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders, for liars, for perjurers, for whatever else is contrary to the sound of to, to sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to you and me. Paul says me here, but now it's entrusted to us. The only way that we turn a nation around is we go back to God. And we can't sit and hope that our neighbor gets there because they're so sinful and wicked. We, we ourselves need to return back to God. We ourselves need to start getting into God's word, as you do every day. Thank you. We ourselves need to start standing firm on truth. You know, stop letting TV moguls tell us what the truth is. Let's tell people what the truth is. And the truth is this book right here. That's what the truth is. And we, we as, uh, uh, as citizens of heaven and citizens of America, we must tell the truth. We must speak the truth. We must not allow anybody to deny the truth. Uh, we must stand on it uh, even to our death. And, and you still live in a free country so that you can, you can proclaim the truth. Uh, proclaim it. You have a right to proclaim it. Are we living in perilous times? Yes. Are we living in tumultuous times? Yes. But never in my life, as an evangelist and as an ordained pastor, have I saw the, the, the need for Jesus and the opportunity to bring people to Christ more than right now. What am I saying? You, the church, you have a chance to not be sleeping, but to find your friends that, are, that have a heart to hear the Word of God and bring them out of their sleeper and into a personal walk with you. Every one of you can do it. I know every one of you. God loves you. You've been awoken by God to proclaim Christ to the world so that the world can know Him. No matter how bad it gets in this country, we can help people become citizens of heaven. And you just stand firm on truth. And that will set people free. And so Paul says, I thank Christ our Lord, who's given me strength as he gives you strength. And he considered me trustworthy as God considers you trustworthy. Say, well, how do you know God's considered me trustworthy? Well, is Jesus living in your heart? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. God considered Jesus trustworthy and Jesus gave his blood for your sin. And now he's taken, he's taken residency in you. So because he's taken residency in you, you are now trustworthy, and he's appointed you to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer, Paul was a blasphemer, I was a blasphemer. Here's a little secret. You were too. A blasphemer, a, a, a persecutor, a violent man or woman, violent even with our lips. We, we talk negative talk, we hurt people, we gossip, we slander, we backbite. Paul says, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and in unbelief. The grace of our Lord has poured out on me abundantly. And God's mercy is poured out on you abundantly. That's how we start living for the Lord. When the mercy of God pours so abundantly out onto us that we find ourselves completely free in Christ. Free to know the love of God. Here's a trustworthy saying, verse 15, that deserves full acceptance from Christ Jesus. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. That's Paul speaking. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst sinners, the worst sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Wow. The more you realize how bad of a sinner you really were, the more it doesn't matter how bad of a sinner the world is. You just go to them and you you find boldness to tell them how they can be set free because you know how you were set free. And that, that joy of proclaiming Christ to a lost and dying world gives you the hope, verse 17, now to the king of eternal, 
prophet. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, and only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Then in verse 18, he says this, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command. I want you to just think about this. He says, Timothy, my son, I could be saying right now, Jody, my daughter, Brian, my son, Lulu, my daughter, Sharon, my daughter, Orville, my son, um, Yvonne, my daughter, Don, my daughter, Gwen, my daughter, Cheryl, my daughter, um, Pamela, my daughter, Tracy, my daughter. Listen, as Paul rolls into this, he's not just speaking to Timothy here. He's speaking to anybody who's received the same gospel grace as Timothy received from Paul. That's Jesus Christ. He's saying, Timothy, my son, my daughter, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, hold on to the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and have suffered shipwreck with regard to faith. Among them, uh, Hermaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that the that 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 that, that the the um, I like how the King James put this. I handed over to Satan, that I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to be taught not to blaspheme. And King James says, I've handed them over so that the their bodies may devour, so their soul may be saved. It's good stuff. So the Apostle Paul here. He's responsible for leading Timothy to faith. And I know, as I know each of you, I know you have people in your life that you're responsible for. People that you love, grandchildren, um, siblings. Some of you, um, even a spouse. You know your spouse doesn't know Jesus. But there are people in your life who have, who have you know, they go to church. They're, they're kind of, they're, they're nice at times, but you know, you know their very nature. Billy Graham said, the thing that you love most is your God. Their very nature is NFL on Sunday morning. Their very nature is their own children, you know, running to every sporting event. By George, they'll put their kids in sporting. They'll be sitting in the stand. They'll be cheering on their kids, making sure that they're at every game. But when it comes to Sunday morning, no, I could get COVID. I don't want to go to church. That's not good. And we're called the witness to people that, that have placed false gods in front of the one true God. And Paul was responsible for leading Timothy to the faith in Jesus. And in this way, Timothy's uh, Timothy looks at Paul as a spiritual father. Like any good father, Paul is concerned about Timothy. He wants the very best for Timothy, as you and I want the very best. We want the very best for the, those that we love. He describes Timothy, to whom this letter was written, as his young son in the faith, my dear friends. Um, I look at some of you as, as children in the faith. Timothy has become uh, a lead pastor uh, there in Ephesus. He's doing the work. Paul gives him instruction on leadership and how to deal with the problems in the church. These are great uh, issues that, that, that only God can work through his anointed. That's you. To help solve people's problems. And that's done in the church. And right now even though we can't meet, meet here at Victory. We are the electronic church. We are solving problems together. God is working through some of these issues. Some personal problems. Maybe you have uh, uh, depression today. Good morning Chris Meininger. Maybe you have uh, sorrows. Because you've been locked up since March. You've got to be plugged into God's church because the greatest pill for depression is Jesus. And Jesus comes to you through his church and we are the church right now, the electronic church, giving you the holy pill of heaven to, to break through depression. You, you need one another. 
And you need to be with one another physically. That's why here at Victory, we offer a, a, a normal service where, where people um, aren't, they're not compromised. And then we offer a service in the old sanctuary, which is heavy duty protection for people that are compromised. But we want people to be together because when the church comes together electronically and physically, I know some of you, you're in Minneapolis, you can't drive here. And you can't get out. Well, then the next best thing is what we're doing right now. And God works by faith through the word which I read to you, which I read in verse 4. And the goal of this command is that you know that you're loved by God through me and through each other. And this comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith in verse 5. Love and faith always work together. Paul lists um, all of the sins that are that are to be avoided at all costs in verses 8 through 11. These are the sins that will destroy the faith that God has been putting into you. Uh, he says among these is slave trading. That's when you have com control over someone. You say, oh, I've, slavery hasn't happened since the 1800s. Well, actually, there are people that steal, are stealing kids off the streets today and turning them into sexual slaves. That's one kind of slave trade. Here's another kind. Um, you know, um, for many years, I was around a person who was manipulative, angry, and controlling, and, um, and, and very, very forceful with his opinions for many years. And uh, that person was a slave trader, and I was a slave, and others around him. And he was broken. You know what one of the best things about old age is? When you're old and you're dying, you get a chance to reflect back on your life. Because the older you get, the more, the more limited you become. And the more humbling it is. And God gives you the gift of old age so that you can look back and say, hear the word of God and say, Jesus, was I that, was I that bad of a slave trader? Was I a manipulator of people? Did I, did I control their spirits and mind? Yes, you did. And for some of you, you have been slaves. And I want you to know Jesus says that your slavery is over. You're now free. Slavery is the opposite of freedom. And trafficking people is an ab abomination. And anytime you have emotional, mental, and spiritual manipulation to push someone down and cause them to feel awful and wicked to not be free in Jesus that is that then people become slave traders and slave traders need to be outed amen paul goes on to give his own testimony in which love and freedom are intertwined and once once he was a blasphemer and paul said a persecutor he was a persecutor of the Christian church. He was a violent man. He described himself as the worst of sinners. I can remember, I remember back in college when I was a lukewarm churchgoer. I would go to church every now and then with a wedding, a funeral, uh, maybe a Christmas Eve service. I, I didn't know God. Yes, I was confirmed. Yes, I was baptized. But I had never walked in the promise. I didn't know the promise. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise, by the way. I didn't. I was not a born-again Christian like you are. I was just a religious person trying to get my way through life, trying to, by hook or by, by, hook or by crook, uh, figure out a way to, to, to con someone into the next, uh, maybe I can go hunting with this person. Maybe I can get a job. With maybe I can get her for a girlfriend. She's cute. Maybe I can... Uh, that I was always looking for the, the way to, 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 to get one step up. And I realized that I was. He described himself as the worst of sinners. And I'll tell you what, the more I look back on my life, as I read God's word, as I study God's word, the more I recognize I was the worst of sinners. And I still am. What do you mean? You're still doing that stuff? No, but my mind is sometimes. My, my attitude is, I, I can't corral it in. So what do I do? Just confess it to you, the church, because you're Jesus. 
Did you know the church is the body of Jesus? And what do you do? Well, if you're kind of where I'm at, you've recognized, yeah, pastor, I'm in the same boat. I just need the gospel. I need to hear the good news. I need to be forgiven daily. And then I need to walk in the promise and truth of God so that others can be set free because I am a hopeless, helpless sinner washed in the blood of Christ. And I know, God, I know God looks at me as perfect because I wear the perfect robe of righteousness, but why do I keep lugging around my guilt and shame? Because we struggle. We're sinner and we're saint. We struggle with that old nature every day. But this is why we keep coming back and back and back to the Word of God. Much earlier, Paul described himself as the least of the apostles who does not even deserve to be called an apostle in 1 Corinthians 15.9. Later on, he says, I am the least than the least of all of God's people in Ephesians 3.8. Think of that. First he says, I'm the least apostle in 1 Corinthians. Then in Ephesians he said, I am the least of all God's people. And now here in 1 Timothy 1.16, Paul describes himself as the worst of sinners. Yes, the more I'm in the word of God, the more I see myself for who I really am. And when Adam and Eve bit the apple and sin grabbed hold of my heart the second I was conceived in Yvonne's womb. I wasn't somewhat sinful. I wasn't. I didn't have one little morsel of sin. I was 100% dark, wicked, evil to the core. Nothing good about me sinful. And the more I study God's word, the more I read God's word, the more I recognize, oh, I look good on the outside, but on the inside, the attitude of my heart Oh, now I know why I said and did the things I did when I was a teenager in early 20s and even 30s and 40s. Why I was a, a 1 Corinthians 15, 9 when I first came to Christ. Oh, I'm the least of the apostles. Still dealing with uh, 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 some pride, but getting older. Got a little bit older, got into the church, recognized, hey, there are things within the church. There are some struggles within the church that uh, I don't really know how to deal with. What do I do? Call my old friends, call the elders, go through things. I learned the word tentatio, my old do Dr. Bo taught us in, in seminary, uh, suffering. He said, man, if God's called you into the ministry, we'll see if you're really called. Because those that are really called, they suffer with the church. The older I got in the church, the more I, my hairline continued to recede. The more my, my waistline continued to... Uh, Exceed, the more I started to describe myself as the worst of sinners. Because old age is a gift from God from, to humble old Sean and to help me to see how really I am dependent on every verb God gives through his word of good news to help me lean into him and his church and to you and to say we can do this together. Let's just... Tell each other the promises. Let's encourage each other in the promises. Let's run the race together. Because it seems like the, the more Paul grew in his relationship with the Lord, the, more, the, the closer he came into the light of Christ, and the more he saw his unworthiness, but the more he was hungry to live out a life of righteousness. I think it's often true that, that as we go on in the Christian life, our, our conviction of sin increases and our appreciation for God's forgiveness, love, and mercy grows in us and we want to spill love's, God's love, forgiveness, and mercy onto the world around us, onto our grandchildren and our children. We know that it's only by understanding how forgiven and loved and merciful they are in Christ, the more they get the, the newness of God and the ability to walk out of it. You see, true guilt is not an unhealthy emotion, provided it is followed by repentance and forgiveness. One theologian said it this way, Our churches are full of the nicest, kindest people who never have known the despair of guilt and the breathless wonder of forgiveness. Let me say this one more time. Debbie Lacey, O'Brien will fill you in, dear sister. Good to have you, though. Let me just say this one more time. Our churches are full of the nicest, kindest people who have never known the despair of guilt or the breathless 
the breathless wonder of forgiveness. I believe you know that. That's why you're, you're God's forgiven electronic church marching as soldiers into a lost and dying world. Because Jesus has set us free. Jesus came into the world to save sinners like you and me. Of whom we, we recognize with the gift of old, getting older, and the gift of his word, the gift of his gospel, we recognize that we are the worst. Paul said, I am the worst. Verse 15. But what does your salvation mean? Salvation means freedom. Salvation means that it came about as a result of God's grace. Grace, God's redemption at Christ's expense. G-R-C-E. And, 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 and we know that that freedom came about as a result of God's grace. So we as believers, we do not wallow in our past. That, that is... That is slavery. It is bondage. Stop wallowing in your past. You are forgiven. You are set free. Break free from those chains that God has said. They're no longer on your wrists. Peace to you. Grace mixed with faith and love poured over me and into me and onto you and onto our friends and neighbors. It becomes Jesus and all because of Jesus. Verse 14. The Christian love flows out of God's love for you which is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5. And right now, as I speak this, the love of God is pouring into your heart, giving you faith to confess your sins, see you for who you really are as a hopeless, helpless sinner, seeing you for who you really are, a forgiven, perfect saint of heaven, washed in the blood, renewed in the, in the pureness and the what righteousness of Christ, Christian love, is not the victim of an emotion, but it is the servant of, of, the, of, of the will of God that now reigns and lives in you. It's a beautiful thing. And Paul became an example for others who would believe in Jesus Christ and receive eternal life in 1 Timothy 1.16, to believe in him and to act in faith. And now God came to live and dwell in you so that like Paul, you can become an example to others around you, to children, to siblings, to parents, to aunts and uncles, to neighbors, to friends, to old friends in college and high school. My dear friends, if you don't know it, you better know it now that this world is falling apart. Just turn on the news. I don't care what news outlet you watch. You're going to see hatred, division. You're going to see attacks like never before. You're going to see a country unraveling. Your country is unraveling. Just look at it. Just listen to people. I don't care if you're pro-Trump or anti-Trump. This world is coming apart at the seams. And it may be held, it may hold together and it may not, but you are not a citizen of here for eternity. You're just a, a short-term citizen here. Yes, you own your property. Yes, you own your land, your house. Maybe you're renting, but you're really a citizen of heaven. And you're passing through, my dear friends. And the initial act of faith needs to be followed by a life of faith. And Paul urges Timothy to fight the good fight. I'm urging you to fight the good fight. I'm urging you to hold on to the faith. I'm urging you to stop arguing politics and start preaching Christ and helping people to know Jesus because the Bible says when it gets this bad, when the world starts to quake, when tsunamis are happening and earthquakes are happening and there's wars and rumors of war, when the Bible says that things are falling apart like, like they are right now, Jesus' eminent return is soon. It could be tonight. Who do you know that doesn't know Jesus? Get on the phone. Call them now, right after I, I get off of this uh, study, because you are the salt and light. You are the voice of God. Uh, I'm just one encouraging you to do. I don't know those people that you know, but you know them. And you have Jesus living in you. You say, yeah, but pastor, I don't even know God's word. But you have God's story. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. You know that. You got your story. I, I confess my sin. I 
am now a, a, a child of God. I get it. So you got God's story, your story, and your story will become their story. That's the perfect trifold Holy Spirit triune work of God living in you, pouring out of you in a lost and dying world. Paul urges Timothy to fight the good fight. I'm urging you, if you are a born-again Christian, have the faith. Fight the good fight. Step out boldly. The church, rise up. You're soldiers of the king. He's calling the trumpet is sounding. Let us go forth and fight the good fight. Let us hold on to the faith, verses 18 and 19. Hold on to the faith. Help us to warn others that their faith has been shipwrecked because of what they were born with. And God has come and he has redeemed them, set them free, washed them in the blood, helped them to confess their sin. Remind them of the importance of what Paul declares to Timothy, to pursue the love and mercy of God. The train of God is pulling out of the, out of the, uh, 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 oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it's, it's pulling out of the, out of the train depot. And it's, it's moving out to the world and you don't want to be sitting in the train depot until Jesus returns huddled up praying to God that you learn the Bible better or you get the... No, you're, guess what? God's put the armor on you. You're ready to go. You're anointed by God. You're anointed by God. I wanted to share this one story with you. Do you remember? Do you guys remember last Friday? I think it was Friday. Thursday or Friday? No, it was Friday. Do you remember last Friday? You were all on here with me. Do you remember? Well, there was a person on here listening because you invited that person to come on and listen. After we got done, I prayed with, with, with you, the Electronic Church, to receive Jesus into your heart, to be born again, so that you knew that if you died on Friday, you'd go to be with Jesus. You, you were saved. I got, a, I got a message from this person. They said, Pastor Sean, I prayed with you. I received Jesus. He came into my heart. You invited that person on to this, this, this time. And God, through his word, got him. Listen, this is, a, this is an opportunity for us to evangelize the world every day at 9 o'clock. Tuesdays will be 9.30. And we are going to win as many of our friends and family to Christ as we can. I can't do it alone. I'm part of you. You're part of me. We are the electronic church lifting high the cross of Christ, proclaiming the love of God for hopeless and helpless sinners so that they can know God, they can be saved by God, and they can go to heaven when they die. We don't want you to be lukewarm. We want you to be sizzling for Jesus, on fire for Jesus. And the best way to catch on fire is to go out in the highways and byways and tell someone, you need Jesus. He loves you. And we know that because he's living in our heart. Amen. Amen and amen, Father God. In the name of Jesus, I pray for the anointing of God, the blessing of God, the Holy Spirit of God to be upon these dear children of God. Father God, give us the boldness. Give us the strength to do as Paul said to young Timothy. Fight the good fight. Father God, help us to fight the good fight. Help us to see the people that are not in the kingdom. Help us to see the religious people that are missing it. Help us to see the people that are playing church but don't know you. Help us to stand up firm. Help us to, to, to not get into political arguments but to bring the love of God and truth to people that are lost so that they can yield to you, trust you, find you, and, and walk in your grace and mercy. Lord, use your church to be the mouthpiece of heaven and I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus name to fall on every brother and sister listening I pray for your hand to touch any spots of arthritis any spots of sickness any spots of cancer any spots of of knee pain back pain any pains in the body right now that would be causing you to be slowed down in the name of Jesus I pray father God touch touch them heal them in the name of emotional hurts where they have been a slave their whole life and they have been set free in the name of Jesus. Slavery be gone, freedom in Christ to be, be, be made new. And Father, help us to be bold for you, to be new in you, to be, to be, to be secure in you, and to be joyful, 
to be praiseworthy, to be thankful of what you've done for us. So, Lord Jesus, I give you your church. I pray for the anointing of your church. I fan the flame of your church. And I pray that you'd send them to the closest neighbor or relative in the name of Jesus this morning to lift high the promises that have been won and done for them. In the glorious, precious, most powerful name, the name above every name, in the name of Jesus, which we have been saved in the hope that we have, in the name of Jesus, give me an amen. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Church, go. Go and win the loss. They're there for you. The fields are white. I'll tell you what, my Bible study is going to be witnessing. We're going to see coronavirus as the greatest time in the church's history. We saw more people won to Christ during the coronavirus than the last hundred years. You're going to be saying it because we aren't missing this opportunity to help people know you. You're going today in the love of God because he's leading you. Until tomorrow, 9 o'clock, this is Pastor Sean Bowman coming to you live with the Word of God, the holy, precious Word of God, preaching it and teaching it so that people can know Jesus, have a relationship with Jesus, and walk in His newness the way that only God can give you through His Word. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Thanks for joining me.